at some point in our life, and you don't have to raise your hand, but at some point in our life, we have all felt the pain of being rejected, right? We've all experienced it. And as painful that, as that is, there is nothing more painful than, you know, it's one thing to be rejected by another, you know, human being, but there is nothing more painful than to experience the rejection of God. And I think all of us would agree that none of us would ever want to experience that. But there is going to come a time where there is going to be a group of people who God will turn his back on them. And the Bible tells us that. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Jesus said, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then verse 23, he says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I think probably all of us, when we think about that verse, those are words that we never, ever want to hear Jesus say to us. I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. It's interesting the fact that when they come up to Jesus, when they come up to him, they give him kind of a resume of all of the good things that they've done. Wait a minute, didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Look at all these good things that we've done, right? What was their motivation for doing all of these things? I heard somebody say it. Yeah. Look at all of these good things. We deserve this. We deserve to enter heaven because look at all of these good things that we have done. And when they point out all of these good things that they've done, what does Jesus say? He says, I never knew you. Not only does he say, I never knew you, but he says, away from, you, away from me, what? You evil doers. They thought they were doing good. They thought they were doing what is right. But you just, Jesus said, you, you know, in all of your attempts to do what is right, because of the fact that you did not have a relationship with me, instead of doing good, you were doing evil the exact opposite of what they thought they were accomplishing. Again, you, we have the story of the separating of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. Notice that there's only two groups of people, either the sheep or the goats. And all of us, we want to be Sheep, right? How many of us have sung the song, I just want to be a sheep? I hate that song, but anyway. <laughs> oh, all those years of working at summer camp, you know, and now at camp meeting every year, I just want to be a sheep. Oh, man, I'm sick of that song. Anyway, so Matthew 25, I invite you to just turn your Bibles there. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. It 
It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he says why they get to have that inheritance. In verse 35, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. What is you he says you can come into the into my kingdom because of why all of these good things that they did and he lists all these good things you clothed me you fed me you visited me all these good things but then the key is in verse 37 it says then the righteous will answer him lord when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What is the difference? We looked in Matthew chapter 7 that these, the group was saying, Lord, we did all of these things, all of these good things that we did. And Jesus said, I didn't know you. Then here, when he's talking to the group, he identifies the sheep. He says, these are all the good things that you did. Come into my kingdom. What's the difference? Exactly. It all comes down to motive. The one group, they said, we're doing all of these things, so therefore we are assured into the kingdom. This is what we deserve. We are entitled to it because of all the good things we've done. But the righteous who actually get in, they're like, what did we do? What did we do that is worthy of coming in to your kingdom? I don't remember doing any of it because all of those good things that they're doing, it's not because they're trying to earn points, but the fact that they are doing it simply because that is who they are. They don't even give it a second thought. They don't remember it. They don't keep track of it. It's just who they are because they are followers of Jesus. When you think about what Jesus did for all of us on the cross, when you think about how the fact that he selflessly gave up himself so that we could have eternal life, that is our goal. That is our, our witness, our model that we should be following to be like Jesus. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 says, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Christianity is not about a list of do's and don'ts. It is all about a loving relationship between us and our Heavenly Father. And we have to ask ourselves is, do we love Jesus? Because if we know him and if we love him, we are going to choose to serve him and not to continue sinning and living contrary to his will. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 15? If you love me, you will obey what I command. 
or in the King James Version, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So everything that we do has to be based on love. How many of you are in love this morning? It's kind of a trick question, right? Because you're like, I'm not married or I'm not dating or whatever. But all of us, we say, are you in love this morning? All of us should have our hand up. Now, this is, I realize this isn't the best picture. But we often make fun of teenagers, right? You know, when they're in love or they're dating or whatever, and they say, ugh, oh, teenagers, right? And we can look at them and they say, you know, when teenagers are infatuated with each other or whatever, they don't always make the best decisions, right? We always, we always say love is blind, right? And we look at that and we just say, oh, they're so immature. You know, they, they just don't really know what they're doing. Let me tell you something. As somebody who had their parents separate and divorce and have both of their parents remarried, it's not a thing about age. Right? Because let me tell you something. When you're a child and your parents are in their 30s or 40s, and they're getting remarried, they act like a bunch of teenagers. And, you know, here's a picture of these kids. You know, the parents are, you know, the kids are like, oh, no, no, gross. Oh, I don't want to see that, right? There is a reason why parents are supposed to get married first before they have children. Let me tell you from experience. Because when you're watching your parents remarry and stuff, and you're, watching them act like a bunch of teenagers and stuff, it can be a little gross. But the thing is, when you are in love, you tend to do things that, from an outward perspective, might not make a lot of sense. And it doesn't matter how old you are. I remember in college, I was working in the library, and my supervisor at, at Southern it was, it was interesting because she and her daughters had actually lived in Maryland. She was the librarian in academy that I went to, in an academy. And so when her daughter, her youngest daughter graduated, she relocated to Southern. And she was working in the library at Southern, and I worked with her. Her first husband had tragically died from cancer. In the course of her working in the library at Southern, one of the other librarian workers, her, her brother, his wife, also sadly passed away. Now, this guy was probably in his 70s. These were older. I got to be careful here. I might get in trouble. <clears throat> huh? I was in college. They were older. Anyway, older than me. Um, but this, the guy and this, the, the gentleman and this lady, they started dating and they ended up getting married. And it was fun for me to watch this, what I would say was a more mature couple. I'll put it that way. This more mature couple. Because it was fun because they were in love. And the excitement of having that first Lo you know, that love, that loving relationship, knowing that somebody else cared about you. And it was fun. And I got to tease them because he would call the library and I would answer the phone and, you know, I'd be trying to get her attention. And I would say, Juliet, Romeo's on the phone, you know, and of course she would laugh. I mean, these are people in their 70s and 60s. And I was teasing them about their, their relationship. But when you are in love, you do things, again, you do things that don't make sense. When you think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, does it make sense? It really doesn't make sense, the fact that the creator of the universe would send his son to die on the cross for us so that we could have eternal life 
from a human perspective, that does not make sense at all. From a human perspective, you would look at it and you'd say, that's crazy. And in reality is, that is crazy. But the thing is, God is crazy about us. Because God is in love with us. And when you are in love with someone, it is going to motivate you to do crazy things. God was willing to do a crazy thing because he is crazy about us, because he is in love with us. And the question is, are we in love with him? Because if we are in love with him, it should motivate us to do crazy things for God. Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians in our scripture reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, he says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You look at the larger context of those verses, and Paul says, you might think, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, you might think I'm crazy by what I do. But the thing is, the crazy things that I do is because God's love for us compels me to do the things I do. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I've been stoned. I've been left for dead multiple times. But you know what? I do all of it willingly because of God's love for me. And when we look at God's love for us, we see that same kind of love for the people around us. It might not make human sense, but in the eyes of God, when you're crazy about someone else, you are going to do crazy things. I'm not sure how many pastors will quote the Dalai Lama in church, but anyway, it says, if you're showing love to your fellow human beings, you are showing love to your God. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the story of Amy Carmichael, but Amy Carmichael was a young Irish woman working in England in the late 1800s. Amy Carmichael decided to answer God's call to serve in the mission field. Twice rejected for medical reasons, she eventually found a mission agency willing to put her on a ship and send her to India. She arrived with a tropical fever and a temperature of 105. Some missionaries who met her believed she wouldn't last six months, but Amy recovered and she never went home. The young missionary soon discovered that the way to reach the Indian people was not through preaching, but through sacrifice. She wrote, if the ultimate, the hardest, cannot be asked of me, if my fellows hesitate to ask it and turn to someone else, then I know nothing of Calvary's love. So she reached out to the poorest, the youngest, the most despised among them, especially the babies and children given to the Hindu temples who were forced to serve as slaves and were tortured if they were caught trying to escape. She said that there were days when the sky turned black for me because of what I heard and knew was true. Sometimes it was if, as if I saw the Lord Jesus Christ kneeling alone as he knelt long ago under the olive trees. And the only thing that one could, could do was to go softly and kneel down beside him so that he would not be alone in his sorrow over the little children. Amy not only felt sorrow for the children, but she was spurred to action. She rescued them, built a home, and recruited a staff to care for them. To those who profited from the enslavement practices, she was known as the white woman 
who steals children. Amy Carmichael's mission trip ended 55 years later when she died at the age of 83. During that time, she rescued over a thousand abused, abandoned, and enslaved children. And though her stories, prayers, and devotions filled 35 books back in Britain, not once did she return to hear the praises of her friends and supporters. To Amy, anything that called attention to herself stole attention from the God she served. In fact, in 1919, her name was published in a British honors list. When she found out about it, she wrote back to England asking to have her name removed. It troubled her to have an experience so different from his who was despised and rejected, not kindly honored. Ironically, the woman who wanted no honor other than that of being Christ's servant became famous nonetheless as tens of thousands of readers in Britain and America were moved by her writings. Her example of sacrificial love has encouraged countless numbers of Christians to follow her into the mission field. Sound crazy? Yeah, from some perspectives, it is crazy. But for her, the love of God, like the Apostle Paul, compelled her to selflessly give up her life to serve others in the love of God. She said, when I consider the cross of Christ, how can anything that I do be called sacrifice? How many of you are in love this morning? The love that God has showed to each one of us compels us, compels us to love our fellow men in service to God. Thank you.